This is an interview with J. Krishnamurti by Donald Ingram Smith in New Delhi, 1966. It's been a long time since you were in Australia, Krishnaji. Yes, I don't remember exactly when I was there. It must be over 10 years, isn't it? Yes, 1955. You were staying with Spencer English and talking in a hall in Sydney. I don't remember that, but I remember Mr. English and his house on a golf course, I think it was. That's right. I believe you used to go walking on it sometimes. Yes, I used to great walk a great deal on it. Yes, yes. And what I, have... I like walking. Yes. And what have you been doing during this last, say, year in Europe? Oh, I was in Rome. I, I was there for, I think, a month. And we had several group discussions there with Italians mostly. And uh, we spoke Italian and French yes. and English so it, we could understand each other. And also I was in Paris. Huh? I was in Paris for nearly a month and I talked there. And then I went to London. No, on the, sorry, it was the other way around. I was in London first and then Paris. Yes. I talked in London at Friends Hall, which holds about 1,500 people or so. And then I uh, came to Paris, talked there. Yeah. And then I stayed month of June, July and August in Sanan, where we have yearly gathering or from all over the world. And I believe there were 32 nationalities. Really? From all over the world this year, even from Hungary oh. and Romania. From behind the so-called Iron, Iron Curtain. Curtain. And there were, oh, it's quite really quite surprising the number of people there, from nationalities, number of people that turned up. And then I believe you went on to America. Yes, I, I was, I went to America at the end of September, where I was invited to talk at the School of New Social Research in New York. I was there for nearly three weeks. And then I went on to California and talked at Ojai for about, again, six talks for three weeks. And then I came back to Rome and rested a little bit, and here I am. There you are, I've got my whole... Uh, bringing what, yourself up to date with us. Up to date, right. Now there's some questions, sir, that I would like to ask you, if that is okay. Uh, perfectly all right, sir. Now, I wonder, do you think it is possible for a man to fly into his uniqueness, his fullness, within the pattern of society? I wonder what you mean, sir, by uniqueness of the individual. Is an individual unique at all, or he is the result of so many contradictory social, economic, uh, climatic, and nutritional conditioning that he's, as far as one observes, as a human being, he, there is not hardly anything unique. He's really a second-hand human being. Because we are the result of so much propaganda. The propaganda of the church, the propaganda of business, the propaganda of politics. That we, I should think there is hardly anything original, if there was a thing as original left in him. Yes, I understand that now a little. And to actually for him to flower within a limited society, and all societies are bound to be limited, how can anything flower within a very small circle of consciousness? It must explode this narrow uh, limitation and conditioning, and out, perhaps out of that comes a new flowering of human being. Well, now, the difficulty is that most of us feel these restrictions of society, and there's a, a widespread revolt, particularly among young people, against the pressures to conform to, the, to this pattern. 
But the revolt is conformist. It's a mere reaction, a superficial level. Is there any kind of revolt against what one does, dislikes or what? Sir, to re I, one, I think most people notice, don't they, that there is throughout the world a certain discontent and revolt. Yeah. And when they do revolt, it is they are revolting against a pattern, the old establishment and so on and so on and so on. And that revolt invariably creates its own pattern, long hair and uh, LSD and uh, unwashed and sex permissive sexual laxity and so on and so on all this. So this revolt, as one observes historically and at present, one can see it always in, invariably ends up in a pattern perhaps slightly modified, but repeating the same old thing in a, in a different way. Yes, conformist again. Conformist again, like, you'll see what's happened, like in Russia, after, is it 50 years, about 50 yes. years, they've had terrific revolution. So I don't know how many millions of people have been killed for an idea of and gradually they're coming back to the same old hierarchical principle, the high, the middle and the low. The high want to maintain their power at any cost, as the old establishment has tried before, and it, there's the battle is on again from the, between the high and the middle and the low. Yes. And again, there's going to be the same pattern repeated. So I feel mere revolt is not a solution at all. Then wherein does the solution lie? Because in the newest nations, as well as in the old established nations, there's the growth of this centralized power, power to dictate, the power in the communist states, in the democracies, in the totalitarian countries, in the governments of both right and left. Which is centralized power. Yes. Which is Really, if one wants to go into rather deeply, do you, sir? Do sir, you want to go into? I do. If one wants to go into rather deeply, not at the political, economic, social level only, but much more profoundly, I think man is always seeking power, isn't he? Yes. Whether it is the power in the family, or power over another, or to have absolute power as Hitler, Stalin and Mussolini tried to have and had, and they created such havoc as so yes. power invariably, I mean to use a so a rather hackneyed and a moral word, is evil. Yes. All power whether it is uh, one has it over one's wife or the wife has over one's husband, the, in it, intrinsically, there is, a, there is a seed of destructiveness in this power. Yes, of course. Whether it is the politicians have it, or the religious priests have it, or the, uh, the man or the wife, or the wife or the husband, I feel there is, the, in this search for power, Man is really escaping from a from a a deep sense of frustration and fear. Fear of what? Fear of life, fear of being uncertain, fear of death, fear of uh, non existence, and the fear which has been instilled in him through the organized religions of belief, whether it's Christianity or Hinduism or any other organized so-called religious movements, they have always created this sense of apprehension. Yes. This sense that you have to be saved right. by some external power, symbolized in a human being or in a in a certain ideas and that naturally has created in man who is after all the result of centuries of development from the animal and is still the animal this 
sense of power, fear has been inculcated, yes. has been sustained I understand. by society, by religions, by family. So it's there. Whether he likes it or not, or not, it is there. And that's always expressing itself. This sense of what of power of myself, me, the central being. Yes. Me and my family, my country, my my leader, my religion as opposed to your religion, as opposed to your political party. So this division of the world into politics, into geographical, political, sovereign states, as um, religions have divided for themselves, which is another racket. So it goes on. Yeah. All the time this is going on throughout the world, throughout the history. High, middle and low, all of them fighting with each other. Yes. In this fighting with each other, because we continuously talk of peace oh, and prepare no. for war, we continuously go to peace conferences and train Oh, that's all nonsense, sir. Surely nobody believes in all that. When the politician talks about peace, you don't believe it. Nobody believes in anything anymore. Man has lost faith in everything. Any, I mean, not the thoughtless man, the man who has observed, read. He doesn't believe in politicians, in religions, in anything. So, when politicians and the people talk about peace, they don't really mean it. To have peace, actually to have peace, one has to live peacefully. That means one has to live without any nationality, without any religious dogma or belief which separate man, and live peacefully, which means no competition, no ambition, no sense of me first and everybody else second. And that, as that is prevalent and which dominates the world thought at present, you cannot have peace. And, and the world is divided between these blocks of powers, the Russian and the American and the European, and how, how can you have peace? Yes, no possibility. To change this just a little, we're always demanding more leisure, yet all we want when we are not working is to be entertained, to be amused in some way, some form of escape, almost any kind of distraction will do. Why is there this stimulated demand for entertainment, for distraction? Again, sir, one can answer these questions either superficially or rather answer as a means of exploration. Yes. Why, you are asking, aren't you, sir, why human beings seek different ways of being entertained. Yes. You want, you say, why? That's right. You can see religion throughout the world has become a means of a, a religious entertainment, if you like to use that word. Yes. Ceremonial, ceremonial. Ceremonies, masses, it's a kind of stimulation on one side, the stimulation through a church and the mass, which is very beautiful and all the rest of that, and a football. You go to the football and you get, I've seen it on television sometimes, and you see the madness of all that, and people get terribly excited about it, and they go day after day betting and all that, and uh, the cinemas, the television, the books, the music, the um, art museum, everything it seems to me is geared to help man to escape, to escape through amusement, through entertainment, through leisure, which will be gradually be controlled by the entertaining world, whether it's a religious world or a, <laughs> or a or religious organization or the football organization, because man doesn't want to face his own intrinsic worth, his own, his own essence, his own being first. Therefore he says, for God's sake, I, I am nothing, I am frightened of what I am, for God's sake, help me to run away from myself. And we'll be prepared to pay. To I'm be prepared to pay anything. 
Yes. Through drink, through LSD, you know that, sure. LSD, and through um, churches, through football, through drink, through sex, he'll do anything rather than to face his own despair, his loneliness, the utter boredom of existence, which has no meaning anymore, but it has, but to the average person has no meaning at all. So he says, For, give me, entertain me. And there are all the people who are willing to exploit his demand. For a great deal of money? Of course, the money is. Now, there are two problems that are not discussed much in public, perhaps because they're a little bit touchy. One of them is old age and the other one is death. Now, most of us dread old age and the, the, the thought of dying. Is it possible to be free of this fear, which means the basic fear, perhaps? So, if we can disregard the theories, the beliefs, the cunning inventions of man, which has helped him to escape from the central fact of death, which is there is the whole of the Asiatic world that believes in reincarnation, there is the whole Western world that believes in resurrection and all different forms of some kind of survival, yes. which are all beliefs. And if one really did believe, actually believed in reincarnation, actually believed in a resurrection, it would mean it would, you would lead a quite a different life now. Because according to the ideas of reincarnation, the belief that you will be, you will be born next life, and you will pay for the in next life what you have done now or yes. do good. So, what if one really believed that? What is important is how you behave now. And it's the same thing. If you are going to be revived after you die, you sit next to God or whatever it is, you have to be, you have to have the capacity to sit next to somebody whom you consider God. Yes. It means, so, one has to examine this whole question of death and old age, and it is only possible to examine when there is not this fear of death, fear which has been cultivated through oh, millennia. Yes. The Egyptian, ancient Egyptians believed living is only a means to die. And so on, each culture has its own escape. So if we can discard all that, then we can begin to investigate this question of death. Is that what you yes, want to do, sir? Yes, this is what I want to You're do. You're quite sure? I'm quite sure. All right. You see, I think one has to accept old age. Certainly. Because one uses the organism physical organism all the time, wrongly mostly, <coughs> with a great deal of strain. It's like a, a perfectly, marvelously running watch or an exquisitely mechanical instrument, and it, to, to, it must run smoothly. And if you put sand in it, it soon wears it out. It doesn't last more than a day. And with us, we, to make to keep the organism functioning properly, hmm, first one has to eat rightly. Yes. One has to have uh, no conflict, physically or inwardly any conflict, yes. which is like putting sand in a watch. It will stop. And these emotional excitements and all the rest of it are contributory factors for the declining of the mind in old age. That's one factor. Yes. The other factor is, which is much more complex, is this, is the understanding of the fact of death. That there are two things involved. The organism coming to an end, which is 
It may last, the scientists may prolong it for another 50 years or more, but it will be still come to an end. Certainly. There is that factor. There is the other factor, the psychological factor, in which time is involved. I don't know if you want to go into all this, but we a little bit perhaps go into it. What man is really afraid of is not death as such, but leaving everything that he has known. Yes. His family, his character, his work, his unfulfilled ambitions, his, um, his, the things that he has accumulated, all the things he has collected, which is, we can call in one word, known. Yes, the all known. the known. Yes. Now, most of us don't want to be free from the known. No, because we acquired the yeah, whole. Yeah, that is what, that's sure. what we are. Yes. The known. The known is always the past. Yeah. The past is always the, is time. Time, which is the, <laughs> which is the result of thought, which is never new. Thought is never new. Thought is, can never be free, because thought is the response of memory, and memory is the accumulated experience, and so on, so on, so on. Yes. Whether it's racial, uh, and so, uh, we won't go into all that. So, th so there are two problems involved in it. One has to see the fact that the organism coming to an end, that's a fact. Whether you like it or I don't like it, it is so. Yes. Then there is the fact, the psychological fact, that inwardly, inside the skin, we want to go on. Because that's all we know. Know all the things that we have accumulated. The tradition, the experience, the knowledge, my house, my work, my ambitions, my frustrations, my miseries. That's all. This vast collection of conscious as well as unconscious, which I have gathered, which mind has gathered, which becomes the center, which I call the me. And that, that is the fact, the ending of that me is fear. Because I said, what happens if I, if I end me? There's nothing left. So we invent a future life or a resurrection is going to heaven, sit next to God or whatever it is, and so we keep this. But if you brush aside, as I suggested, all that, there are these two factors, old age, which is inevitable. Then there is the psychological fact which is the conscious acknowledgement of what I have acquired yes. as knowledge, mm -hmm. as work, as the family, as the wife, as the husband, as my house, my children, my work, my position, prestige, power, you know, all that the man has created for himself. That is a psychological fact. Yes. And he is afraid to lose that. And I say, you will understand death when the mind begins to free itself from the known. Not at the end, but every day. Every day to die to everything that you have gathered, to all the pleasures. And that, of course, is much more difficult than to die to something which is unpleasant. Most of us want to die to everything that's unpleasant, but to die to the pleasure, which means to die to something which is pleasurable is to be frightened of not having anything. Yes, anything. You pleasure. follow that, sir? Yes. Because at least I have pleasure. If you derive, deprive me of pleasure, what have I left? So I cling to my pleasure whether it is pleasure of smoking, sex, or being a great man, or a big famous person, or this or that, I cl one clings to it. And, um, and you know 
also say inwardly that pleasure is always fading. So there is in there is behind pleasure always this fear. Yes, yes. So to to die to the past, to the known, because known is always the past. There is nothing I can never say. I know. Moment I say I say I know, it's already the past. Yes. Christian G, in relation to this, how does it come about that the thing that man has always tried to be free from is the pain, the agony? He's always tried to get rid of that. He's always tried to retain his pleasure, and the thing he's got is the misery and the pleasure of sleeping. No, because so the pleasure principle is a very complex principle. I don't know if you again if you want to go into it, because you see there is a great difference between joy and pleasure. Pleasure is the product of thought. Joy is not. Pleasure is sustained, built up by thought. I have an experience, mind has an experience, and that experience is thought about. Yes. And if that experience has certain form of pleasure, delight, amusement, thought, think, thought begins to think about it and therefore sustains that pleasure by thinking about it. That's what most people yes. do when they have sex, sexual de demands, sexual pleasures. Mind, thought, thinks about it over and over and over again and then that pleasure must be fulfilled and that becomes pleasure. That's a constant image in the mind. And when, you, when one says, die to everything you know, it means, what have I left? But you see, what, if one has really gone into it deeply, what one has left is joy, real joy of living. Seeing a beautiful tree, a beautiful face, the, uh, the movement of water and the birth, living. Not living in conflict, in misery, in all that is not living. Then out of that, if, if you really die to all that, and death is not something that is prolonged, it comes immediately and so over. So if one can die to the past immediately, and to do that requires a great deal of attention, a great deal of inquiry, a great deal of uh, inward apprehension. Not apprehension in the sense of fear, but uh, inward awareness. Then out of that there is a different kind of life altogether. Therefore there is no fear of death, because you are dying every day to everything that you have gathered. So your mind becomes extraordinarily alert, fresh, young, and if I may use that word, which is so laden, innocent. It's only the innocent mind that can live, not this jaded mind. So we're always looking to authorities one way or another. We have used to look to philosophers and to theologians for answers to our questions and our problems. And now we look to scientists, and if we've got enough money, we look to psychiatrists. But have any authorities Anything for man? So, the word authority, the root of that word, is surely the author, the one who originates. You originate something. And I, because I like what you say, I follow the, what you say. Then you become my authority, because psychologically I find comfort, pleasure, security in your discovery, in your uh, originality or in your way of thinking and feeling, living. And I, I, I like that. I feel that what you say has some importance. Then you become my authority. Then I follow you. And you like being followed. It is not just I follow you only, but you also like being followed. So you, there we are. 
I, you become my leader and I become your follower. So there is not only the technological authority, which is inevitable, which is necessary, but they, I set up a psychological authority because I don't know I'm lost. And you seem to be so terribly certain about everything. So I said, like, by Joe, he's a man who seems to know something psychologically, inwardly, and I just become your slave. That's how religions have survived. The priests have invented a saviour, you know, yes. God and all the rest of it. Not that there is no God, but there is no God of any organised religion. That's just a theoretical idea. And ideas are not God anymore, like uh, ideas is love. So we'll come to that later. So we always want to be told what to do politically, religiously, everywhere. The mother tells the child what to do. So this sense of authority, right through the world, darkens the mind. You must have observed what is taking place in this country. In India. In India, the authority of tradition, the authority of family. And you see the politician say something, and everybody goes gaga over it. You follow gaga in the sense of they get terribly excited. So this, so to be free of authority is one of the most important things, because otherwise we are slaves to propaganda. I do not know, sir, if you have, if you read the other day, or perhaps you, uh, there was a report by a field mar Russian field marshal to the Central Committee in which he said that they were teaching, s naturally, soldiers through hypnotism. Oh, I didn't read it. I read it casually, just, you know, I don't read all these things generally, and I read it. I said, look, I said to myself, I wonder if people understand what this means, what is implied in it. They are inculcating into the, into the Russian soldier not only Len Marx, Leninist ideology, but also how to kill uh, and avoid being killed. So, through hypnotism, they are controlling the mind through which is really propaganda in a most crudest form or the most subtlest form. Yes. And we are the result of this enormous propaganda of the churches, of the religions, of the politician, of the businessman, of the advertisements, of the television, of the books and the radio, and so And they all say, we know, you don't. We have experience, we have the data, we have the computers, and you have poor chap, you know nothing about it. They don't put it so brutally, but we have the means to convince you. And I just say, all right, sir, you convince me, I'm your sheep. Yeah. And the brainwashing is going on all the time, both sides. You don't say oh, the, yes. the Russians behind the Iron Curtain and the behind the West with their churches, with their organization, with their, this man. So everybody is trying to get hold of man's mind. They call it the battle for the mind. That's right. And so the poor chap is caught. They don't teach him how to be free, to examine, to investigate, to be intelligent, to question, to doubt. On the contrary, religions have said, don't doubt, we know. And so did the communists, the Marx Lenin theory, and they finished. That's the ultimate authority about everything, like Mao in China. And it becomes too, for, uh, too immature when you go into it. So authority is really the most destructive force in the world whether it's exercised by the businessman or the politician or the priest, because it, it destroys the, the subtleties of the mind. And the mind is extraordinarily capable of being very subtle. Very quick. 
very quick and you destroy all that because a mind who is free from authority is a dangerous mind to society. Yes. So we cannot be free then so long as we have an idea and act out of that idea. Obviously not. Whether the idea comes from a, an outside authority Absolutely. or our own. Because the moment you act on an idea, on a formula, that formula or that idea has been created by thought, whether it's by your own thought or by the thought by of another. So that there can be authorities inwardly or outwardly? As well as outwardly. Yes. So, when you follow an, I, uh, an ideology, as they, then what that ideology is created by thought which is always old. Therefore, the ideology is never new. It is something dead that you have resurrected, pulled out of your dead ashes and put it there as some ideal, as a future to be attained. It is a dead stuff. It's like in this country, they have preached non-violence for 40 years and they are as violent as ever before. So, ideologies, it seems to me, are the most absurd escape from the fact of violence. To face violence is important, not escape from it, and go beyond violence. So then what do you mean by intelligence then, in relation to all this? What is the intelligent approach to this? So that's a very difficult word to use and to really go into because What is the intelligent approach then, sir? I'm, I'm, first, let's examine the word, sir. Right. The word is so misused. I and mean, you say, well, he's a, he's a very intelligent man because he's capable or he talks very well or he's cunning, he uses words cunningly and he can put something across. And so, he said, by Joe, he's a very intelligent man. But he may be the most stupid man in his daily life. Yes. <clears throat> so, intelligence really doesn't it mean to be really intelligent man, a man who does not act in fragments. Yes. A man who is a businessman is something different in the office and is entirely different at home. Certainly. A scientist, though he may go to the moon, invent the most extraordinary things, computers and so on, so on, so on, he in his laboratory is very intelligent. At home, he is just like anybody else. He's a nationalistic, competitive, ambitious. So, most of us live in fragments, right? A fragmentary life. Each fragment has its own life. And therefore, each fragment is in contradiction with the other. And this contradiction is the very essence of stupidity. Yes. Right? And therefore, we can say you, that intelligence is not to function in fragments. Intelligence is to function totally. Function totally in business, totally as a politician and so on which means you have to take the totality of man, not just as a politician, the totality of a human mind which has lived for over two million years. If one can function that way, that is the highest form of intelligence. But you're asking for an enormous encompassment of... Of course, otherwise so, well, we have lived like this, butchering each other for over two million years. And we're still going on butchering, because we, are, we have still got the animal instinct in us, which is property rights and sexual rights. And the sexual rights we are willing to let go, but not property rights. The property right may be boss of a, of a party, but it's still this desire for power, position, prestige, that makes man function fragmentarily. And therefore he's acting uh, in the most stupid, destructive way. So then, sir, could we come to what then is living all about? What is the meaning of, of, of our living? Living. Right. Is there any meaning in it at now all? Now, just a minute, sir. 
again, you see, you're asking questions, sir, for me, that need a great deal of serious exploration, not just a superficial yes, ten minutes uh, radio conversation between two uh, and, uh, commercials. I know. So you're asking, has life any meaning at all? Right. To put it bluntly. Yes. The organized religions right throughout the world have said there is a meaning. There is a meaning which they have supplied as an idea, as an ideology, or as an act of faith. Yes. They have been supplied it. And I, as a, I'm like a human being, like ordinary human beings, says, oh, they know better than I do, and they, because they have had experience of this and that and the other things, so they supply the significance of life, and I accept it. And the average person accepts it. But nowadays, nobody has any faith in anything. Right. Any intelligence. There's no faith. It's only the old ladies who are, you know, tradition-bound and all the rest of it. So you discard that. The significance, whether the theologians, the philosophers, the analysts, you brush all that aside. Yes, yes. And so you have no significance. So you, your life becomes a despair. So you begin to invent your own significance. Yes. Instead of <clears throat> significance being exposed, um, put upon you, thrust upon you, you are brushed aside, now you begin to invent your own uh, significance, a meaning, a purpose. So, I invent mine and you invent yours, so we begin to come into conflict, into conflict, yes. which is the same as somebody putting uh, significance on to me. Yes. So, our difficulty is, uh, isn't it really, man is afraid to live a life in which the intellectual, theological significance has no meaning anymore. Yes. So he says to himself, I don't want to invent significance for myself, because that's equally stupid as the other film. Yes. So I won't invent whether it is the significance of uh, Camus in Paris, in France, or another latest um, existentialist, or this or that, I, we brush all that aside. So how does one find out what, if there is a significance at, at all? Not my significance or their significance, but if there is significance to life at all. Yes. Now, to find that out, one must face the actual facts of what one is. Yes. That is, one is bored by life. Hmm? The endless conflict, the unending meaningless sorrow, hmm? yes. the physical, psychological pains, the ambitions, the competition, the fear. One has to face all that. Yes. Be aware of it. Be aware of it without any choice. Just, I, I mean, the moment I introduce choice, the mind then is confused and only it can choose. You follow? Yes, sir. When it is confused, it begins to choose. When there is no confusion, it doesn't choose at all. It sees clearly. So, when, when the mind is aware of the totality of this process, which is called living, mm -hmm. in which all the things which I have yes. just mentioned are included, if, to understand them, to be aware of them, not to discard, not to um, suppress them, not to run away from them, to face them, to really go through them. And when one can face them, with real attention, one goes beyond them. Then comes the question 
then the mind is completely empty of all conflict, ambition, all of the past. Then out of that, in that emptiness, there is silence. Rather, to put it really, that silence is emptiness. The two are not separate. And in that state, one dis there is a thing, something totally new, of a different dimension altogether. Nothing mysterious. But it is mysterious as long as you are caught with significance, with your own worries, with your own pains. So, I mean, one, to say there is a significance is to assert some another significance. But if one really understands this whole process, the total process of living, and comes to this extraordinary void and emptiness, and in that emptiness of silence, there is something, a dimension, a quality, a life, a state, which is entirely different. And from there one can act in daily life. It is not you reach that and then live somewhere else. You don't say, so live on an ordinary stupid life. But rather, if, when one comes to that, then from there act. And then you will see that action is very practical, very normal, very sane and rational, because it is, it is a life of real honesty in which there is no contradiction, no hypocrisy, there is no sense of being important, all those immature things, but there is actual, you are living. And this takes no time. Obviously, not, because times are again, as we said, there is the chronological time by the watch, which must exist. If I want to catch a train or have an interview or this or that, there must be time. That chronolog chronological time must exist. But what we are talking about is the psychological time which thought has invented. And thought says, no, this is too difficult, let's go slowly at it. Uh, let me be violent in the meantime. Hmm? And eventually I'll be non-violent, and which never takes place. So thought can stop, and therefore violence stops. And it's an immediate act, not in, in relation to time at all. 